Hey guys, Camina the Coach here. I haven't done a video in a long time because, to be fair, I've been on vacation. And really, really, honestly, I couldn't find a good place to do the video. So, um, welcome back. If uh, you've been missing me, my name is Camina the Coach. If you're new here, my name is, again, Camina the Coach. I've been working and living abroad. Uh, since 2010 2011 I'm currently in my ninth country but not right now I'm on vacation I am um, an education professional in March of 2020 I was forced back into the United States where I aggressively started addressing adoption trauma and early childhood trauma and I was really lucky in 2021 to be able to get back outside of the United States and overseas and that's where I'm at right now. So this channel is a mixture of videos about working and living abroad, um, videos about how to make your life more fulfilling and more productive, or just how to process and move through trauma. And I share my stories and experiences intimately in hopes that it will help other people work through and move through what they've got going on um, in their lives. So um, really what I want to talk about in this video, part of why I haven't done a video is because, uh, so the, what this video is about is, well, my first vacation, my first time traveling abroad, post COVID, post coming out of the fog. So I'm an adoptee, I'm a transracial adoptee. So black woman adopted by white parents. I am a late discovery adoptee. I didn't find out I was adopted until I was 32, long story. Um, <laughs> and I've been on my own since I was 14. So lots of, of trauma surrounding that. And like I said, COVID kind of forced me to really address that stuff. So um, first vacation since COVID, first vacation since addressing these really serious adoption related traumas and early childhood traumas. Um, especially um, uh, for me also then addressing a racialized trauma as well. This vacation honestly has been the most difficult vacation of my life. Um, I think that as I move through my healing journey, the universe says, okay, you've achieved this. Let's push a little more because we don't grow if we're not a little bit uncomfortable. And I think the universe is like, your wish is my command. We want to grow, but that's kind of like our purpose. If we're not growing, we're dying. So um, I think that I had kind of plateaued in my growth and the universe was like, okay, let me help you out a little more. Let's see what else we can achieve by testing you a little bit. So why has it been so challenging? Well, truth be told, the social rules that used to exist seem to not exist anymore. Maybe I was blind to it um, beforehand. So it's very interesting how our brains ignore things until something draws our attention to it. So I don't know if you've ever bought like a car, a black or a white car there are lots of black and white cars so one time I bought a black car and it was I had just bought the car and it was Christmas time and I went to the mall and I parked the car somewhere and I was very distracted and I needed to like do Christmas stuff inside of the mall when I came back out it took me over an hour to I, I had to ask security to help me find my car um, why well you didn't I, I didn't my brain didn't recognize how many black cars there were <laughs> until I had my own black car. And then once I had my own, once I drew my attention to this, now I can see that there are a million cars just like mine because my attention has been drawn to it. So I'm not sure, honestly if it is that people have changed and society has changed a lot, or if it is just now that my 
that I have really had my attention drawn to all the racialized trauma and microaggressions and all that stuff. Um, I'm going to share the experiences. You let me know what you think. Um, I just know that um, for me, I thought that I um, that I kind of had a, a, a scar over the wounds, not a scab, a scar. And I wasn't feeling very raw, but I know that every time, every Every, almost every incident that I'll mention, I felt very raw. I felt um, like it was new, fresh, painful. So I know that there has to be some real growth that's going on because each of these situations was really painful and uncomfortable to me. So I know that there has to be some growth going on and taking place. Um, so, uh, and, and also not just probably just not what has happened in the world, but as you get older, or I, I find that as I get older as a woman, I feel less like taking nonsense from people. Where I used to grin and bear it and not necessarily want to make as many waves, as a 44-year-old woman at this point, I kind of demand respect. So um, I got to Thailand and I ran into somebody that I actually knew uh, about seven years ago in Thailand, an Australian person. And um, there's a little um, bar across the street from the hotel where I was staying. And we happened to both end up there. And um, he kept, he was very, very drunk. And he's very, obviously very unhappy because he's drunk every single day. Um, kept touching me. Um, just here, not inappropriately, but just kept touching me and kept saying, oh yeah, we almost got married and we were almost together and all this stuff. And I'm like, no, that's not what happened. And just over and over and over. Yeah, we were almost married. We were almost married. And not remotely. I'm not sure how old he is, but he looks very old. And, uh for all the reasons anyways and he was with a Thai woman when I was there before there's not a chance that that was ever gonna happen and so eventually I was like please stop touching me that didn't happen stop asserting that and he continued on and then at that point he was cut off like you can't interact with me anymore and probably five or six times while the, in the time that I was there, he really made a big fuss about this because he lives close to that little bar and it's across the street from my hotel, so I was there quite often. And it was really uncomfortable. Five or six different times we had these interactions. I'm like, don't touch me. Don't talk to me. And the owners, Thai people are very relaxed and calm and don't like confrontation, but the owners of the bar had to step in a couple of times. It was really uncomfortable. Um, so that, in addition to that one, um, I'm not sure with it, where this gentleman is from, but um, having a, a decent night and um, I had ran into somebody and we went out for a little bit and then I came back to the little bar before I went back to my hotel and um, I don't know how we're talking about, I guess, Poland or something. And I was kind of, you know, uh, commiserating the, the stress that Poland has had put on it over its history. And somehow we ended up on black American politics. I have no idea. And he launches into trying to explain to me how hard life is for white people. And how and 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 then tried talking to me about how black American politics is, are overstated and it's not like that and he's not American even he's not black and he's not American I was like these are not your politics and you should stop talking about it I said it two or three times and the last time I said it I said it loud enough that everybody kind of stopped. And he ignored what I said, skipped over it, and continued on talking about it. So I just went ahead and, and politely got up and excused myself from the situation. At this point, I'm like, 
there's probably something wrong with me. The common denominator in all of this stuff was me. So I, I was like, wow, there's, there's something wrong with me. So the young lady that I had gone out with that night, we messaged the next day. I was, I was looking forward to like enjoying some time hanging out with her. She was amazing. Um, however, she sent me this really long text and she was like, oh, I wish you would have been with me. I know you would have, would have told this guy off. He came up to me. So she's a white British woman. And uh, so she was apparently um, approached by a black man and he, I don't know what the exchange was, but he then told her that she, according to her anyways, told her that she was racist and she was just wildly offended. And she felt like I would have told him off for her. Um, right is right, wrong is wrong, for sure. Uh, I've mentioned the book before, My Grandmother's Hands by Rosa Menikin, and uh, one of the things that he says that I really love is that trauma presented over time in a community is mistaken as culture. And it is true that um, there is a trauma in the in globally that runs through the blood and the genes of black people not just black americans but globally um we were decimated for and, and enslaved for hundreds of years and still not treated very well in most parts of the world to be honest also understanding that there is this thing this push pull inside of white people that is afraid of black people but then also wants to be comforted by black people and so that's what she was doing she was looking for me to comfort her and assure her that she's not racist and that everything is okay. Well, the truth is, is I am inherent, inherently we're all biased. Just because you have black nieces and nephews, her, her sister has had children by a black man. And just because you have black nieces and nephews doesn't mean you're not racist. My mother is racist and, and here I am. So it just because you have black family members doesn't mean you're not racist. And it's not any black person's job to Molly coddle you and assure you that you're not racist. It's your work to do. It's your heavy lifting to do. And you can't just assume that just because um, I have black family members that you're not racist. It's work that you need to do. And it's not my job or any other black person's job to assure you that life is all right and that you're a wonderful person. So I just didn't respond. I just didn't respond. And I'm glad that she didn't message me again. So that was third. Um, I'm adopted. We've already talked about that. I ran into two couples from New Zealand who I actually encountered um, seven years ago as well. And I went out with those guys. They remembered that I was adopted. That's strange, seven years ago. One of them has a adopted Chinese sister. And it's like, I feel like a lot of times people feel the need to convince me that adoption is not that bad. Uh, so after we've watched a rugby match and spent a nice afternoon together, she like launches into the story of her sister and telling me how, I'm like, is this appropriate bar language? Like, like is this, what we're doing like like I, so I've shared you know just tiny bits of, of you know how the trauma of adoption has shaped me so you're trying to I don't know what you feel like you're going to accomplish by convincing me that adoption is great for some people I know that adoption is great for some people I actually have some friends 
that had really great adoptive parents and are actually really thankful. They remember being adopted and they remember being in the orphanage and they had they, they got adopted to amazing parents and I'm absolutely happy for them. But I don't understand what what are you trying to accomplish? Like we're impaired. You know, why what do you what do you choose to what are you hoping to accomplish? And and both of the women ended up in this conversation. It was very uncomfortable. Oh, and she wants to be buried with our parents because she doesn't have anybody else. And I'm just like, it was just very, why are you telling her story? You know, like, who knows what she actually thinks and feels. It's her story and her experience. If you're an adopted sibling, you can talk about your experience of it, but you can't really speak on her perception of it, really. So, that. Um, <laughs> I, and I feel like this was all, I guess it was spread out. It kind of felt like it was all at one time. It did. It felt like it was all at one time. But um, then I had, uh, um, so just a couple of little other small encounters. But So, moving on to, I was in Thailand for about a month. And all of these, so the, the biggest ones is the, the, the gentleman who wouldn't stop touching me and then the, the gentleman talking about American race relations who's not American and who's not black. Um, <laughs> so now I'm in Dubai and I got here about two days ago and um, I went in for happy hour at one of the, I'm in a, a nice hotel so there's many little pubs inside of the hotel and I went in side of one of the bars to just sit down and have a, a glass of wine before dinner and um, uh, eventually a group of gentlemen had invited me over and one of the men was from Botswana and I and so we're all kind of talking about you know just stuff and it very very quickly I mean I hadn't even been there 10 minutes before he was telling me that um, Obama was the worst president the United States had ever had and that the reason why the United States is the way that it is right now is because of Obama and that we're still under the Obama regime and that's the reason why things won't get any better. And then he was like, but I'm not talking politics. I was like, you definitely are talking politics. And I gathered up my things and prepared to like move away. And it's not necessarily that I have a very strong opinion about um, Obama's presidency. I don't get into politics. And it just seemed to me that it used to be the case that when you're in a casual social situation where you don't know people, that we didn't talk about polit politics and religion. So that's what I was talking about, the black car thing. So I feel like I'm not sure if it's that my mind has been drawn to it because I've had, had attention drawn to it or if it really has always been this way where people felt like it was okay to talk about such personal topics in a very casual social situation. Did I miss something? I'm not sure which one it is. If people have really, really changed post-COVID and as the internet kind of puppeteers them have people changed that much or again is it just that because I've had my attention drawn to adoption issues racial issues and political issues is that what it is I, or it could be both and maybe it's not either or maybe it's a combination of the two who knows but it has been a very very challenging vacation as a result of this stuff um, what does that mean for me? It means an opportunity to grow. Finding a, a, a way to find peace inside of all of this angst. Happiness is not a perpetual state. It's an emotion that waxes and wanes. Sometimes we're happy. Sometimes we're frustrated. Sometimes we're fed up. Sometimes we're angry. It, happiness is not a perpetual state of being. But peace can be. And this is my challenge. To find a way to have peace inside of a 
very um, angsty, uncomfortable set of situations with different sets of people. I'm the common denominator in all of those things. So at the end of the day, it really is my issue to address. Whether they were wrong or I was wrong, it doesn't really matter. Nobody was wrong, really. If I'm uncomfortable, it's my, my responsibility to address that stuff. So this has been my experience, my first vacation um, abroad, post-COVID, post-coming out of the fog, post-reunion. And it's been a challenge. It has. It's been a challenge. Um, I don't have much of a support system anymore. So I feel like I am going to have to actively seek out some kind of support group at this point. But, um, and I am actually um, also looking for uh, a more comfortable, peaceful working situation. So that's where I am at the moment. Uh, I'd love to hear your experiences. Is anybody else? Is it just me? What's your take on it? Like, um, is anybody else experiencing this kind of eh, post-COVID? Um, is it people? Is it just me? Probably a combination of the, the two. But anyways, that's all I had to say today. No huge words of wisdom other than peace is your responsibility. Happy, happiness is not a perpetual state of feeling. feeling. And if you are feeling... Um, angsty, it, look at it as an opportunity to grow because um, we don't grow during moments of comfort. So until next time, my name is Kamina the Coach, sending you love, light, peace, and joy. And until next time, I will see you. Peace.